So then today is Saturday of the fourth after the, of the fourth week of Lent, fourth Sunday of Lent, or Sitzientes Saturday, Thursday and Saturday. The Mass for this, it's also the first Saturday. We have the Mass today, though, the, the Sacred Mass of Lent. And uh, we have the uh, after Mass will be a little benediction uh, after the Mass. The Epistle for the Sitzientes Saturday, for this fourth Saturday, Sunday, uh, after the fourth Sunday of Lent, is taken from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 19. Or 40, uh, chapter 49 Thus saith the Lord In an acceptable time I have heard thee and in the day of salvation I have helped thee and I have preserved thee and given thee to be a covenant of the people that thou mightest raise up the earth and possess the inheritance that were destroyed that thou mightest say to them that were are bound, Come forth, and to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be every plain. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun strike them. For he that is merciful to them shall be their shepherd, and at the fountains of waters he shall give them drink. And I will make all my mountains away. And my paths shall be exalted. Behold, these shall come from afar. And behold, these from the north and from the sea. And these from the south country. Give praise, O ye heavens. And rejoice, O earth. Ye mountains, give praise with jubilation. Because the Lord hath comforted his people. And will have mercy on his poor ones. And Sion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and the Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her infant, so, that, as, so as not to have pity on the son of her womb? And if she should forget, yet will not I forget thee, saith the Lord Almighty. And in the Gospel, taking that according to St. John, stand for the Gospel, then according to St. John chapter 8. At that time Jesus spoke to the multitudes of the Jews, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me walketh not in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, Thou givest testimony of thyself. Thy testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Although I give testimony of myself, my testimony is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go. But you know not whence I come, or whither I go. You judge according to the flesh. I judge not any man, and if I do judge, my judgment is true, because I am not alone. But I and the Father have sent me. And in your law it is written, that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that giveth testimony of myself, and the Father hath sent me, giveth testimony of me. They said therefore to him, Where is thy father? And Jesus answered, Neither me do you know, nor my father. If you did know me, perhaps you would know my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury, teaching in the temple, and no man lays hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. Thus far the words of the day's holy gospel. Today is a very sacred Saturday in the entire year. This is a day for the ordination of priests. The last 2,000 years, perhaps hundreds of thousands of priests have been ordained on this day. It is called Sitzientes Saturday, the Saturday of the thirsting. And the thirst of the souls on earth the thirst of mankind is quenched by the priesthood. And so this is a day of the traditional ordination of priests. And it is a day 
in which this mass, this ancient mass, is written with a view of the priesthood and the ordination of the priest and what the priest does on this Sitzienta Saturday. And this day we say in the intro from the book of Isaiah also, Sitzientes veniti ad aquas dicit dominus. All you that thirst, that's the Sitzientes, you that are thirsting, come to the waters, saith the Lord. And you that have no money, come and drink with joy. Attend, O my people, to my law. Incline thy ears to the words of my mouth. And so this is the day of the priesthood. And today, it's good to be here in, uh, again in, in Adelaide. Since here last year, now you've, uh, you know, about ten months ago, whenever it was, when I came the first time, now you've got this magnificent cathedral. We've got the red carpet, we've got the communion rail, we've got the tabernacle, we've got the pews, we've got kneelers. This is a really it's one of the most beautiful of all the chapels. Uh, that you know, remember we're saying mass in the catacombs now, and this is a very beautiful catacomb uh, in which we have the mass, and so it's a very good, you know, the, and 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 if there is never another mass, if there's only one mass, it's always worthwhile to make things the best we can. If there never comes another mass, then fine, one mass is sufficient. But it is very beautiful to have this this place well prepared for the holy sacrifice. But in any case, this is. The, the day of new considerations on this Sitzienta is Saturday, the day of the priesthood. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is on this day that so many priests have been ordained down the last 2,000 years. This day of the ordination of priests during the season of Lent, in the last few days before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, on Good Friday in the Great Battle. And a priest is a man who's sent. Remember St. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, How can you have the faith? Without faith it's impossible to please God. But from whence comes the faith? Fides ex auditu. Faith comes from hearing. But how can there be hearing unless there be preachers? And how can there be preachers unless they be sent? The ascending of the priests, they are preachers, but preachers, priests are not preachers like the Protestants, or like teachers in a catechism class, or like teachers in a university. Priests do preach the truth, but the truth that we preach is alive. The truth that, the truth that we preach is a man. The truth that we preach is God. The truth that we preach is living. And therefore there's something special about the preaching of the priest which no one can uh, in any one can be, can be, cannot be compared in any way to the discussion of other men. And why is this? It says in the instructio pro ordinibus, an instruction for those to be ordained, for the holy orders. In this instructio it says, from whence comes the power of the priest to preach? Why is it that Preaching our Lord Jesus Christ requires more than a certificate. You know, when you, when you go to college, you study for four years, and they give you a worthless piece of paper. Unless you study for six years, they give you a more worthless piece of paper. And if you study for 12 years, they give you a more worthless piece of paper. And these worthless pieces of paper says, you know, doctor of garbage, PhD. Doctor of that stuff which is piled high and deep, which is why it's called PhD. <laughs> so you become a doctor of stuff piled high and deep. <laughs> and this is what the doctor it is. I got a piece of paper. A priest is not a man with a piece of paper. He's not a man with a doctorate, though many priests have doctorates. It is not a man with a sheet of paper. He is a man who has the power to communicate the truth. And whence comes this power? Whence comes it? It comes from the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It says in the Instructio Pro Denibus, the priest must preach the Word of God. And some have claimed, like St. Thomas Aquinas says, it is true that it says in the Gospel that the deacons were assigned to take care of the tables and take care of the normal ministration, the seven deacons, of which the most famous is St. Stephen. And these seven deacons are set so that the priests could, so the apostles could administer themselves in preaching. But is the priest firstly a preacher? And the answer of the Holy Mother Church and the answer of St. Thomas Aquinas is no. He is first the offerer of the sacrifice. 
And from this offering of the sacrifice comes the power and the necessity of preaching. The deacon, for instance, has the power to preach. Before you're a deacon, you cannot preach. And it says in the Instructio Prodinibus, why does a deacon have the power to preach? Because a deacon does not make Christ present on the altar. But what does a deacon do? The deacon, during the holy sacrifice of the Mass, he reaches into the tabernacle, and he takes the ciborium out, and he places it on the corporal. And he also... Whenever the, whenever the pole must be removed from the chalice, the deacon is the one who removes it. Now in the absence of a deacon, because the priest is also a deacon, he does that himself as well. Because we are not only priests, we are deacons. Because we are members of holy orders. The priest has seven holy orders inside of himself. And they are distinct orders. Now as a deacon he preaches. As a priest he offers the holy sacrifice. As an exorcist, he casts out the devil. As an acolyte, he is an example to men. As a porter, he opens and door opens and closes the doors of the church, letting in the just and keeping out the wicked. As a lector, he teaches catechism. And in everything he does, he fulfills each of these seven holy orders. And the higher order contains the lower order. So that if he's ordained a priest, he contains diaconate and the other orders. But from whence comes the power to preach? To speak the word of God in a way that gives the feeding of the thirst of souls. This is the Sitzientes. Come to the waters. Where do you come to the waters? All you that thirst. And he also says those who do not have money. And this is important because many priests have a problem called simony. In the Philippines it's a big problem. In the, in the, in the western world, it's in, in, in the, many of the Spanish speaking world, it's a big problem. When you come up, for instance, in order to receive confirmation... There's a, there's a, there's a, you have to have, make sure you're baptized and make sure you've paid your stipendia. If you haven't paid the stipend, you don't get confirmed. So you walk up and you hand a sheet of paper that's your receipt that proved that you paid. If you didn't pay, forget it, get out of here, you're not getting confirmed. And what it says in the, in, in the, in the, uh, the, the Sitzientes, those who are thirst, let them come. And also those that have no money. And so that's a message to the newly ordained priest. <laughs> It's true that people are supposed to give money to a priest. It is correct, and it is an obligation of the people. But let the priest recognize that he must give the sacraments, and he must give the preaching of the true faith, and he must bring Christ to all that thirst, including if they don't have any money. While at the same time, man does have an obligation to pay for the Levites. And this is what it is said in sacred scripture, and it is an obligation of souls. But we give the we give we give all those that thirst are those that are the subjects of the priest. He goes throughout the world looking for the thirsting souls, and they are thirsting for the waters of divine truth. They are thirsting for the waters of divine life. And the priest carries those waters inside of him, which are carried inside of a rock. And St. Paul speaks of that rock. At Petrus Erat Christus. And the rock was Christ. This is the rock that was in the middle of the desert. And the priest is a rock. He's not a sponge. He's a rock. And he is a rock that is very hard. Like unto the rock that is Peter. Or the rock that is Christ. Or oh, the rock upon which Jesus Christ was crucified, called the rock of Golgotha, the place of the skull. He is a rock. A rock that is the place of the skull, where Christ is crucified. A rock that sits in the desert, like the rock that, Saint, that, that Moses took a staff, a wooden stick, and he hit that rock. And out came waters that the people might drink. One thing to know about these waters that came out of the rock is that the Jews were in the desert. And they either drank the water that came from that rock, or they died of thirst. There was no other source of water to quench their thirst. And so the priest must be a rock. And this rock is sent. He is sent. And he goes throughout the world, and he is never alone. And here we see this, about our Lord Jesus Christ. Because on this particular day, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8, one of his great battles with the enemies of God. And who are these enemies? False priests. These enemies were priests of God. 
They were priests of the Old Testament who were supposed to be representatives of God, who were supposed to be pointing the way to the Messiah, who had the legal jurisdiction. You know that there's a simple way, a foolish, a, a, a wrong way of looking at jurisdiction, and that is jurisdiction is a piece of paper. Jurisdiction is not a piece of paper. It is being sent. Sent by God in order to give souls the truth. One thing about this rock. Remember Moses hit the rock twice. And why did he hit the rock twice? Because when he hit it the first time, he doubted. And when he hit the rock the first time with doubt, water did not come forth. It would have come forth. If only he had been patient. But Moses wasn't sure. And therefore he hit the rock a second time. And the water came out the second time. And remember when God came to Moses and he said to him, I am angry with you, Moses, because I didn't tell you to hit the rock twice. You're only supposed to hit the rock once. With confidence. But you doubted. You doubted. And you hit the rock a second time. And because of this doubt, you shall not enter the promised land. And Moses died without entering the promised land. And so, doubt. Doubt is something that the priest of God cannot have. What is he going to do? He's going to carry a rock, not a sponge. He's not going to carry a water bucket. He is not going to drive in a fire truck with a big, huge water engine, a tank of water behind him, and a nice fire hose. He is going to walk into the world with a rock, with a stone. And people are going to come to him and say, Father, I'm thirsty. Give me to drink. And he will take out the rock. If you want to drink, suck on this rock. <laughs> and water will come out. But what happens? Many priests doubt. That water can come out of a rock. You know there are so many miracles. Of many saints. Where water came out of the rock. Even in America. We have miracles of uh, Mother Catherine. Of, of, of uh, Saint. Uh, Mother, Mother Cabrini. Saint Francis Cabrini. She too hit a rock with a staff. And out came water. And it comes out of that rock to this day. In Colorado. She had a little walking stick. She built a place. For. Her orphans, and she didn't pay for it because she was a good Catholic. She uh, she, called, she told the, the, the contractors to build, and they sent her a bill. And she put Deo Gracias and sent back the bill. <laughs> and they all wanted to quit. And they were angry at this little four-foot short little lady. And they all, each contractor and worker said, I'm going to quit. It was right, you quit first. No, you quit first, and then I'll quit. <laughs> they were terrified to quit. They said, I'm not going to do anything she said. She said, do this. So they did. So they finally built everything. And when they were finished, the head contractor said to Mother Catherine, I mean to St. Francis Cabrini, your children are at the bottom of the mountain in Denver. When they come up to this mountain, they need to drink, and there's no water here. And so therefore, you, we built your little house for your orphans, but they cannot drink. And she took a stick and said, you want water? Here it is. And she hit a rock with a stick. And water came out of the rock, from whence it still comes out to this day, a hundred years later. Water can come out of a rock. The only water that is going to thirst, quench the thirst of man is the water that comes out of a rock. And the rock is Christ. And our Lord built His church upon the rock, which is Petrus, Peter also. And He sends the priest. He sends him. And these priests ordained on this day, they must recognize that they are to go out into the world in order to quench the thirst of souls. To bring souls the divine water, which can only come out of a rock. It doesn't come from the streams of this world. It doesn't come from the salt water in the oceans. It comes from a rock. And that rock is in the desert. And only a man who recognizes that he is in a desert will find this rock. We must realize we are in a desert. If you are not in a desert then you don't need the water that comes from a rock because there's water inside of the streams. There's water that comes from below, outside of your little well. But in the desert, you can't dig enough to get down far enough to find the water. And there is no stream. And so whence comes the water out of a rock? 
And the priest is sent. He has jurisdiction. What is the cause of the jurisdiction? It is true that in the ordinary situation in the church, the bishop says to a young man who is ordained a priest, you obey me, I will give you the jurisdiction. And I assign to you uh, Saint, uh, Saint, uh, the, the parish of St. Odo, and the parish of St. Joseph, and so on. I assign you to this parish, and you have the right to speak the faith to the souls in this parish, and I give you the jury, I send you. But whence comes the power of the bishop to send? It comes from Christ. It comes from the Holy Mother, the church. It comes from the rock that is the truth. That's where it comes from. So what does this mean? If the bishop cuts himself off from the truth, if he looks for another source of water, another source of life, and this is the problem of the ecumenical church of today, the modernist church of New Concilia Rome, it looks for another kind of life. It wants to find water from other streams. It wants to say Buddha provides a good water. But the problem with that bother is it comes from your belly button and that's not healthy stuff. <laughs> and the same is true of all false religions. There is poison in the water. And this water does not give life and it is salt water which the more you drink the more you thirst and you die more quickly. It is not water of life. It is not living water. Living water comes only from the sacred rock of the divine truth found only in Jesus Christ in his mystical body the Holy Mother of the Church and in the priesthood. The priest is the one who carries this rock and he never travels alone. And here Jesus Christ speaks as the priest and the Pharisees therefore said to him, Thou givest testimony of thyself. Thy testimony is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, Although I give testimony of myself, my testimony is true. For I know whence I came, I know whither I go. But you know not whence I came, and you know not whither I go. The priests that are ordained in this day are sent. From whence did they come? They come from the rock of Calvary, which is called Golgotha, the place of the skull. They come from the rock of Peter, which is uh, our holy mother, the church. And they come from the rock of the desert that was struck by Moses, which is the rock that gives us the sacred water that fills us with charity and sanctifying grace. They come from the rock. And they go out into the world, which is a desert. And the priest must know when I go out of this chapel into the world, I'm going into a desert. And do not think it is not a desert. And he goes alone into the desert. But he is never alone. Who when Francis Xavier went to India, and Thomas, a thousand five hundred years before him, went to India, where I had the privilege to be stationed for four years. When he went to India, he spoke to them alone. But he was never alone. He said, why are you worshipping these false gods? I bring with me the true God. He never travels alone. And Christ was not alone either. I know from whence I come. I know where I go. This is the first hallmark of the priest. The priest is one who knows from whence he comes. But the enemies of God do not know whence the priest is. They don't know that he comes from God. They don't know that the priest of the New Testament was consecrated a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. They don't know that the priest is connected to something infinite and eternal, and that when the priest stands at the altar of God, what does he say? This is my body. He does not say this is the body of the Christ. This is my body. And when he says those words, God hears the priest. And he comes into that bread. And the bread is gone. Finished. Just as when the priest sits there in his chair. In judgment. Bless you father if I have sinned. I murdered my father-in-law. Murdered my mother-in-law. Murdered all my cousins and everybody else. And he says. Ego te absolvo. It's finished. God speaks. And the sin is gone. In an instant. And he says the words similar to which our Lord spoke on the cross because he is another Christ. 
Or the sinner turned to him and he said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the priest turns, speaking the words of Christ, and he says, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And this is why the priest must be there when a man is dying. To see that he goes to paradise. The priest is there when a child is born. Because a child is not born happy. That's why he cries when he's born. The child is not born the friend of God. The child is not born innocent. The child is born in a desert. The child is born guilty. The child is born danger of death. And the priest comes with the water of life. And he pours the water of life over his head. And when before he does that, he says, Why are you here at my church? What do you ask of the church of God? Faith. What does faith offer to you? Eternal life. This is the water. The water of our divine faith. And the priest has jurisdiction. He has authority. He has power. When he is connected to the divine truth. Why is it that these priests today, they have a piece of paper, the local priest in the local parish, he says the new mass, he has ordinary jurisdiction, but he has no power before God. Because he says the new mass, which takes away his power, which is a non-Catholic Protestant mass, it is an abomination before God, and it cuts away his power. And then he speaks a gospel which is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore it takes away his power. And he is bringing a water which is not the water of God. Which does not come from the rock of Christ. Which does not come from the rock of Peter. Why did our holy founder, Archbishop Marcel de Fev, say in 1974, The only way in which I can be faithful to the Holy Father, who at that time was Paul VI, now is Pope Francis, The only way in which I can remain faithful to the Holy Father is by preaching the gospel without any admixture with the abomination of Vatican II. And I must preach the gospel truly. I must preach the gospel fully. I must give the gospel to those souls that that need it, which is every soul on earth. Every soul needs the gospel. And the power of jurisdiction that is given by our Holy Church to bishops that is given by our Holy Church to priests. It is a jurisdiction over the salvation of souls. It is a jurisdiction which is used for the purpose of bringing souls away from hell into heaven, away from lies into truth, away from death into life. And so they say, well, where is your jurisdiction? Where is your celebrate? Where is your piece of paper? We come with God. We come with the power of the divine truth. We don't come with a piece of paper. In the normal times of the church, when the bishop is doing his duty, at least essentially, by preaching the Catholic faith, and the Pope is doing his duty by preaching the Catholic faith, then we come visibly and openly in his name. But when the Pope is not doing his duty, we come also in his name. And we maintain a fidelity. We are faithful to Pope Francis. But the millions or hundreds of thousands of other priests who are not preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not faithful. In order to be faithful to the Pope, we must be faithful to the rock. We must be faithful to that faith that comes from us, comes from God. And when we celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass, it is Christ that is made present, the true Christ. And that true Christ must be communicated to souls. There comes the power of the priest to preach. Because he puts Christ on the altar, therefore he must has a power to bring Christ to souls. Who has no connection to Christ on the altar, has no connection to souls. The priesthood is essential for the quenching of the thirst and the holding of the truth. And therefore our Lord, speaking as the priest, says to those Pharisees, For I know whence I come, and whither I go. He comes from the Father. He goes to the Father. But you know not whence I come or whither I go. You judge according to the flesh. I judge not any man. And if I do judge, my judgment is true because I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. 
When the priest judges as the father judges, he is not alone. When the priest judges against the father, he is alone. It's like your fan. The power is on. Plug it in, and it goes... Unplug it, and it stops. (laughs) Plug it in, and it goes. Unplug it, and it stops. And so it is with the priest. He is sent. So long as he's plugged into the true faith, so long as he's plugged into this to the Father and the Father's teaching, so long as he's plugged into the Son who died on the cross for our sins and who is the living truth, so long as he's plugged into the Holy Ghost who sent the priests throughout the world to fill souls with the grace of God, then he is sent. When he unplugs, he's not sent anymore. Plugs in again, he is sent. Unplugs, he is not sent. And so we cannot obey the priest blindly. We cannot follow him blindly. But when the priest is plugged in to the faith, then he has power. When he is plugged into the holy sacrifice, one of the troubles today is that many priests, for instance, indult priests, celebrate the Latin Tridentine Mass. But they are not plugged into the truth that it stands for. They aren't plugged in. Why? Because they accept modernism. They accept heresy of the Vatican II. They accept the error of the new mass. And by accepting these things, they unplug themselves from the divine truth. Because the truth is complete and whole and never allows itself to be admixed with error. And so we must plug in to the rock. When Moses hit the rock, he was Moses. But no water came out. Because Moses was filled with doubt. And when he hit the rock a second time, God allowed the water to come out. But then he punished Moses. Because of his doubt. So we must pray to God for priests. Priests for the Holy Church. Priests that will quench the thirst of souls. By being connected so tightly to the rock that they will never separate from it. They, and priests that recognize when they open their eyes and walk under the world that the world that is not with Christ is a desert. And any soul that is not the friend of God is dying of thirst and dying of starvation. And the priest comes to pour the water of life into every soul. He wants every soul to receive the water of the divine life. The water of the divine truth. And these are the souls that God, God demands the priest to come and save. Because our Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven. And what did he do? He came into the earth. And remember a priest is a soldier. And as St. Joseph of Apostle says, he is a fisherman. What is a fisherman, says St. Joseph of A fisherman is a layer of traps. That's what he does. He takes nets and throws them in the ocean. Innocent fish come by and he captures them and puts them in his boat. <laughs> and the priest is a layer of traps. And he says, St. Joseph of says, Priests recognize you must always be laying traps. <laughs> Wherever the priest goes, he smiles, he talks, he does all kinds of things. What's he trying to do? Capture souls. <laughs> That's what he's trying to do. Everything is to capture souls. And he says you can never let them know exactly what you're doing. Because they might swim away from the net. And if they do, you got another one to grab them on the other side. Priests are layers of traps. Priests are captains in an army. Priests are those that carry the water that comes from a rock. And they are those that offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And this holy sacrifice without the faith, this holy sacrifice without the water coming from that rock, it is, it is not able to save souls. Here it's a sacrifice, and from the sacrifice, the whole faith. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that this holy sacrifice of the Mass, this holy blessed sacrament, it is the sacrament of the unity of the church. And therefore, when a heretic celebrates the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, he commits a sacrilege every time because he is not connected with the unity of the church. He doesn't believe what Jesus Christ taught. He said, Not one jot or tittle of my word shall pass. Heaven and earth shall pass, but my word shall not pass. 
He knows faith. He knows certitude. Like one example we mentioned in the newsletter that we're going to send out in the next couple of days. Man must sometimes choose between certitude and certitude. And St. Thomas Aquinas tells us the greatest certitude is a certitude of faith. And the priest must know that. And every Catholic must know that. So one day, for instance, you may be approached by a civil magistrate. As I mentioned in the example in the newsletter, it's going to go out in a moment, in a short time. You may be approached by a civil magistrate and he says, you must choose. If you do not offer incense to this idol, or in the near future, if you do not accept this mark of the beast, and you do not make a small burning of incense to the Antichrist, then it is certain that you shall have your head removed from your body by beheading. And so you must choose between certitude and certitude. The one certitude is the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Another certitude is, if I, have, if I don't accept a strange god, at least outwardly, I'm going to have my head removed. And so I've got the certitude of offending God or the certitude of my head being removed. Which certitude is the one that will guide us? The one that is more certain to us. And the truth is that if your head is removed, it's only a temporary problem. Whereas if your soul offends God, it's an eternal problem. Because God has a head replacement program that will be given to you at the last judgment. Whether your head is cut off or it decays or whatever happens to it, your head will be reunited to your body at the last judgment. So God's got a head replacement problem. They're the head replacement program, a lot better than the present hair, remo hair replacement program they have for men. And you don't have to re-replace the hair. You don't have to re-replace the head when Christ provides the head. And so losing your head's a temporary problem. And God's got a solution for it. But losing your soul is an eternal problem and there's no solution for it. And remember also, we know the example of the true story of the saints. True history. Dennis once, the saint who converted the city of Paris... He was preaching to the emperor, or not the emperor, but the local magistrate that was condemning him to death. He wasn't finished preaching. And so the magistrate was not happy, and he cut off his head. Dennis wasn't finished. So his body stood up without his head. His hand picked up his own head, and he held his head in the air, and he kept preaching. He wasn't done yet. God can work with heads that don't have bodies and bodies that don't have heads. It's not a problem. But no one can be without the faith of God. And the duty of the priests is to tell the people the rock of certitude. You must understand the rock of certitude and that is that our faith is the only truth. Everything else is only a truth by analogy and only a temporary truth. Because when Jesus Christ said, heaven and earth will pass, but my words will not pass, he wasn't just saying a nice analogy for a sermon. That's what the modern homosexual faggot modernists say. That is not what Jesus Christ said. He said, heaven and earth will pass. Guess what? It's passing. Your head is passing. Your hair is passing. Everything that God made is passing. But heaven and earth passes, but His word does not pass. And He said that He is the true God and only God. And that we must be ready to die for Him. And if we die for Him, we receive an eternal glory. I mean, in the Old Testament they even knew that. The great Judas the Hammer, Judas Maccabeus, 156 years before Christ, the last great leader of the Jews, the third son of the Maccabees, on the day of his death, Judas told his followers, he says, we can retreat because there's only 800 of us and there's 40,000 of them and today if we fight, we shall not win. We can retreat, but we will nonetheless die or we can die today and live forever. 
Which shall it be? And they said, let us live forever. And they went into battle. And 2,000 years later, they still live. They fought from the morning until night. And they killed many of the enemies of God. And then they perished temporarily. And Judas Maccabeus, that great saint of the Old Testament, the last great saint of the Old Testament, he shall be seen at the end of the world, his body reunited to his soul. He who purified the temple on December the 25th, 150 years, three years before Christ decided to be born, he decided to be conceived, to be born into this world on the day that Judas the hammer purified the temple. He honored that sacred day by his coming into the earth on that day. And we must be ready to die for Christ because that's only a temporary problem. Because it is easily repaired. Lazarus died and he was uh, four days later he was back in business. And he rose him from the dead. And so it is that we must recognize what is certain. What is truth. He is truth who is on the altar. And the modernists want us to doubt truth. And this is the satanic power of the devil. He cannot defeat the truth. But what he does is he defeats souls that doubt it. Therefore, how do we conquer Satan? Do not doubt. And if we do, remember the prayer of that man in the gospel. Lord, I do not believe. I believe, rather. Help my unbelief. We believe, but we're a little afraid. We believe, but we don't believe like we should. And therefore, he says, I believe. Help my unbelief. And therefore, the priest goes out into the world. He is not alone. No matter whether there is no one with him or anyone with him. St. Jerome said, I will preach the truth if all the world listens. I will preach the truth if only a few listen. And if no one listens, I will nevertheless preach the truth. Because God, who is the truth, listens. And he shall judge me on my day of judgment. And he shall say, Father Jerome, did you preach my word? Did you preach the truth? We must preach it. Cannot be preached without this sacrifice. Cannot be preached without the rock of Golgotha. Cannot be preached without the rock of our holy church. We are truly the servants of the Holy Father, even if he doesn't know it. It won't be the first time in which a father has killed his innocent son. We are the true servants of the Holy Father. We are the true servants of the Holy Church. We are the true servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we go out into the world to preach the truth that comes from the rock. And to quench the thirst of souls in need. And everywhere in the world there are souls without Christ. And these are souls dying of thirst. Souls that are now committing suicide all over the world. Souls that are taking all kinds of medication in order to end their depression. They don't need medication, they need the love of God. They don't need a medication, they need the faith that comes from the Holy Mother of the Church. They need the answer to the troubles of the world, which is not foolish, modern, idiotic, satanic policies that come from the Antichrist preparers, those who are preparing for the Antichrist, but they need the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And when the Pope, the Holy Father, finally listens to heaven, there shall come a great victory. And this victory, of this victory, there is no doubt. If we doubt, it's only because we are fools. But there is no doubt. What Mary said will happen. Our Lord will never deny His mother any of her requests. And His will will be accomplished through her. And she shall crush the head of the serpent. And there shall be a great victory. And all we must do between now and that victory is have the certitude of the rock of faith and pray that there be priests that God sends into the world who are going to maintain this certitude. We're going to answer the call and fulfill, fulfill, answer the call and fulfill the thirst. Pour the water out to those souls that thirst. Pray for vocations. Can God raise vocations of an idiot modern kid who knows nothing except rock and roll? Who knows nothing except for his iPhone how to say <laughs> Can God make such a man a priest? He can make anyone a priest. He has made the deaf a priest. He has made the blind a priest. He has made the dumb priests. He has made the wicked, cowardly priests. He can make anyone he wants to be a priest. As long as it is a man. 
We're now in a world of faggots. <laughs> it's got to be a man. <laughs> you can make any man, even the weakest man, a priest. And all he does is pour in his divine grace. Because whence comes the power of the priest? It comes from God, not from the idiot and his background, his pedigree. It comes from God. And he will send the priests, whoever he wishes. So we pray for those priests. So there's one who was born out of due time, like Saul of Tarsus, who became the greatest of the apostles. Born out of due time. And so anyone whom God wishes may become a priest. All that is necessary is they come to the water and drink. They receive the calling from God, which is called the vocation, to be called by God, not by men. And then he pours in his power. What kind of exercise program can a man do to be able to lift up the Blessed Sacrament? Which is Christ, which is God, which is the Creator, which is heavier than the world. It takes the grace of God and the infinite mercy of God and the power of God for the priest to be able to do anything that is priestly. Therefore, we don't have to be strong. We don't have to be intelligent. We only have to be called by God and be ready to follow Him wherever He leads and ready to bring all souls we meet into this water of the comes from the rock, and the rock is Christ. Close that God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.